Greetings. My name is Dr. Leah Gunning Francis, and I'm the Dean at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our class, Teens and Tweens, Ministry with Youth in Church and Community. In this summer class, we've had a great opportunity to really dig into what are some of the dynamics of what it means to be in ministry with youth today, both in the church and in the broader community. And so for our final project, we decided that instead of just keeping all of this wealth of information that we've been digging into to ourselves, we'd bring just a snippet of it to you so that you might be informed and hopefully inspired to consider what it means to be a part of the village that is attending to a very, very crucial issue in our society. And that issue is the issue of juvenile justice. And and so today we're going to hear from our wonderful students and some of the really pertinent information that they are bringing to us to help us understand how we as a community, as the village, can band together, work together to ensure that all of our youth are attended to in ways that are um, promoting wholeness and wellness, and in particular, addressing the very critical issue of juvenile justice in our society. I'm pleased to introduce to you today each of our four presenters. Danielle Briggs just finished her first year at CTS in the MDiv program. She is a native of Indianapolis and currently serves as an associate minister at Mount Pleasant Missionary Baptist Church. Danielle is a talented artist and she loves singing, performing, and supporting the arts. James Rogers is a second year student in our MDiv program. He is a native of Indianapolis and currently attends Eastern Star Church where he teaches Sunday school and Bible studies. He also loves to sing and considers himself a lifelong learner and loves to share that learning with others. Reagan Robinson is in his final semester at CTS, yay, in the MDiv program. He's a native of Hammond, Indiana, and currently is serving the St. John's Baptist Church in Gary, where he has been the pastor for seven years. He is also the proud father of a teen and a tween. And last but not least, Stacy Webb is just finished her first year in the MDiv program here at CTS. She too is a native of Indianapolis and is the associate minister at St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church here in Indy and is the state youth director for the General Missionary Baptist State Convention of Indiana Incorporated. Stacy has a big heart for young people and is the proud mother of two amazing children. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to uh, bring our students to you today and I pray and trust you will enjoy what they have to share. So Danielle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dean. I think I could speak on behalf of the class and say it's been both a blessing and a pleasure to be a part of this, this academic journey, just learning about teens and tweens and the juvenile justice system. So we will go ahead and jump into what we have to present today. Let me get my screen shared here. Give me just a moment. All right. Okay, so everybody can see the screen. We're good to go. Awesome. So we'll be talking about bridging the gap, the role of the village in juvenile justice. Um, I think it's so important to go ahead and set that agenda that we have for today. So I'll be introducing us to uh, the juvenile justice system and the Black church, just giving you a little history on you know, what that's looked like from point of inception to current. Uh, then I'm going to pass it to my colleague, James, who's going to give you some brain science behind it all, you know, youth, uh, adolescent development, maybe even some barriers to that so we can better understand not only what they're experiencing and feeling, but how we can step in and really advocate for them. Reagan then is going to give us some rates on ethnicity and race and time, some percentages, what's what that has looked like, and then to the probation piece, uh, just recidivism, um, what, what we're looking at for today and possibly 
even how to address or think about how to address those matters. And then Stacy's going to bring it home with the village, the components of the village, how the village has been and can be involved, what programs and, and avenues and initiatives do we have in place for that. So that's what we'll be jumping into today. As I shared, um, establishing the juvenile justice system. So um, just to really kind of give you some background here, in the 1820s, there was a, a large population of immigrants coming to the United States, more specifically the East Coast. And so a few years later, 1825, some charitable groups got together and established what it was called Houses of Refuge. So more specifically, the first one was in New York, and really this was to help address juvenile offenses. Um, the reason that this came along is that in the, the English common law, um, a lot of youth were acquitted. So they really wanted to make sure that youth were not being tried with adult punishments. So that's really where that came into play, where they, they brought along these houses of refuge. And of course, they followed this daily schedule of schooling, work, prayer, then lights out. But similar to what we're seeing today, um, a lot of those houses of refuge became overcrowded. And so the issue with that is when you have this overcrowding that's going on, there are youth that might be acting out against the staff. And I want to put a little caveat there. When you're thinking about immigrants coming to a land that they don't know, they don't know the lay of the land, there's poverty, there's lack of education. When you layer in all the different pieces to that, not to mention in the 1820s, um, when all this was going on and when these charitable groups put these houses of refuge together, this is just 36 years after the first president of the United States took an oath to be in office. If we're really setting the precedent to better understand what we're up against, think about that. George Washington, just a, a young adult's lifetime years ago, and now these these houses are being put into place. So you're thinking about enslaved people and the perception of brown and black bodies and people and behavior. When you couple that into everything that's going on at this time and the overcrowding, maybe the perception could be they're acting out. But in their, their mind, they're thinking, well, I don't know how to act because I'm in this new place. And so putting all that together, the, the staff that are at these houses are mistreating the youth, mistreating the adolescents. You know, there's beatings, there's running away, they're rioting, but you got to consider as many possibilities as possible. It may not just be them acting out. And so um, they're starting to become more like children's jails. Um, and because the overcrowding is happening, there's these reformatories and training schools that are, are being created, and now the populations are becoming mixed. You're putting impoverished children that may actually be mixed in with children that had real offenses. And so that then becomes more of an issue, and it wasn't until 1899 that the first juvenile courts were established in Chicago and Denver. Um, the, the, the main point behind this, again, they were leaning into the, the well-being of the, the adolescent. They really wanted to focus on rehabilitation, which you'll see that a lot now uh, in the explanation or the mission behind the juvenile justice system was rehabilitation and treatment. They wanted to lean into that. They really wanted to focus on the well-being and really the, the cause behind the misbehavior. So with that, that mindset, they didn't allow or did not give uh, adolescents, youth, they didn't give them lawyers, strict rules of evidence, juries, or public hearings because they really wanted to make it separate from, you know, the due processing, um, like for adult punishment. Then you add in probation officers a few years later in 1910 who really were just there to investigate the social and family background. You know, where is this adolescent coming from? What are they up against? What's their environment about? And they were supposed to work hand in hand with the judge to determine the best course of action. Well, again, brown and black bodies. Um, the, the treatment is not always equal. And so, of course, a lot of critics felt that same thing as well. They thought the judge held entirely too much power. And even though there may have been some good apples, there were still those bad apples that were, you know, mistreating and, and not assigning the proper care um, for whatever the offense may have been. And then, of course, it wasn't until 
over a hundred years later, after, after the inception of these houses of refuge, over a hundred years, that young people finally got the right to a lawyer and certain due process rights. Not all of them, just certain ones. Um, this is because of a particular case study for Enri Galt. Uh, sort of the backstory behind that is that a teenager that was in a juvenile facility had placed a phone call that eventually the judge got, got wind of. And for whatever reason, it was off-putting or obscene. And so this 15-year-old was sentenced to six more years for something that in an adult prison would have just been a $50 fine. So there you go with, with the disparity and the maltreatment you know, of youth not getting fair due process. And again, this is over 100 years later. That's what we're up against. Now we're, we're looking at the system more presently. And something that I found to be very interesting is that there's not one overall arching system. There are 51 different juvenile justice systems, not one. Um, each state and the District of Columbia has its own laws and, and, and governs based on its jurisdiction. And then you can filter that approach down to county. So even by county, the rules that they go by could be entirely different. So you got this filter down approach, top down, then it goes to state jurisdiction, then it goes to county. And when you think about what's going on, you think about the disparity, you think about how there's a lot of mistreatment, that's really problematic. Um, something else I found very interesting is that more of the most recent data that I found was probably at latest 2018, 2019. Um, courts are not required to report information uh, regarding the juvenile justice system. And so right now we're probably sitting at about only two thirds accurate information that's out there and none of it is national. Um, so really we're, we're, we're already looking at skewed data that exists currently. Um, something that I happen to find is that 750,000 young people were referred to juvenile courts for something that would have violated a criminal code, but in that same breath, 101,000 of them were just status offenses. So as you see here, running away, consuming alcohol, skipping school, et cetera, something that should not have escalated to a juvenile court referral, where it should have been something where we're trying to address the well-being of, of that adolescent with the family or counselors or someone else to step in and really mitigate them being sent into a system for confinement. So this is what we're running into, all these problems, these layers, um, the widespread violence and maltreatment of adolescents, this over-reliance of just escalating the matter directly to juvenile court just to put them in a, in a juvenile facility of confinement. Again, the disparities piece, racial and ethnic. And then overall, it's just that failure to be able to advocate and protect our young adults, our youth, um, that are in the juvenile system today. So where does the Black church come into play? Well, in my research, the foundation of the Black community has been primarily composed of preachers and teachers. Um, you know, that, that pursuit of freedom, even from the early 1800s, and, you know, it could be argued that not much has changed. Um, that, that pursuit for freedom was done through, you know, education. And really for them, it was a survival tactic. But Again, arguably, we could still argue that it's the same today. They wanted to uh, increase their, their, their material possessions and just have a better way of life. Um, there were church-sponsored schools that really advocated for the youth um, in those times. They wanted to make sure that they were providing basic literacy and religious instruction to really help them navigate um, what their immediate environment was during those times. Um, even white Northerners that, that went to the South to create these schools for Black people, of course, were bare minimum. They didn't really give them all the provisions they needed. So the Black community and Black church said, no, we just gonna keep it in house and make sure that we're taking care of our own. And so even uh, in 1970, it was only a 58% attendance rate of Black students. So it's like, what's the point? We're gonna still continue to take care of ours because what you're providing us isn't sufficient. Um, and so something really cool that I found is that the literacy rates continue to rise from 6% at the close of the Civil War, I believe that's mid 1800s, um, to 77% by the 1930s. So the, the true education um, and teaching and helping them to develop 
and the nurturing was happening within the Black community and the Black churches. Um, arguably something that's a little bit more recent, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. The Black church honestly stood behind, Black church, Black community, Black leaders stood behind that to wage and eventually win that educational apartheid. Um, but again, religion, education, Black church community really standing in for the, the struggle of Black people to really help them um, progress in life. So African-American churches reducing crime, um, something that I found very, very relevant in a particular article I was reading. Operating through institutions of informal social control, such as the family and school, they, they lend themselves to either partly mediate to buffer to offset the harmful effects of community disorder. So again, standing behind our youth and really advocating for them to lessen the impacts of the environment that they experience. Um, African-American churches, Black church has been the earliest vehicle for that social control and just internal support within the community. Um, religious networks are another, so it may not necessarily be church, but just anyone that that has a faith that they practice and, and, and believe in, um, just the, the community that comes from that to be able to bring social order. Um, even outside of that, morality, integrity, um, teaching that within the community is what also helped to lessen um, the, the juvenile offenses that were occurring. And, and presently, there's still some conclusive data that shows that there's still a link between church and community being involved to help lessen, um, you know, juvenile behavior that lands them in the juvenile justice system. This is just a chart that I happen to find, again, from 2019, that really speaks to exactly what we're talking about, where now there's that shift in the juvenile justice system, where it's no longer really, really focused on the well-being, and, and, and more so it's focused on the punishment. As you see here, like roughly two-thirds of this pie chart is showing that it's, it's the confinement piece. We want to focus on punishment, adult punishment. And you know some of these offenses, as you see around the circle, are a little bit more major. Some are really minor, um, but you see where the focus is. We're not looking at the well-being of the adolescent. We want to escalate the problem, and and they land in confinement, and that's that's something that you know definitely needs to change. So that brings me to that restorative justice piece. How can we show up for our youth? There's always been that tension between social welfare and social control. And you know what I'm saying by that is again, well-being versus focusing specifically on the punishment and trying to bring down the hammer and, and all that mess. You know, how do we step in and bring that restorative justice to our youth to really focus on their well-being, their development, and create that safe space? You know, is it what can we do in our communities? What can we do in church? You know, what are the collaborative efforts that can be implemented to really shift that pipeline to prison culture and nurture, you know, those coming behind us? And so I think that we'll we'll learn here as we go along more efforts that can be put in place. We'll learn more of the, the rates and the backgrounds that we're up against. But more specifically, James is going to you know inform us a little bit more, educate us more about how to better understand our youth, talking about brain science and you know their overall development. So James, I will pass it to you. Thank you, Danielle. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thank you, Danielle. All right, so um, today I would like to discuss uh, how the adolescent mind operates and changes according to brain science, okay? So how different the mind is from early childhood and adult years. Uh, during this time, uh, I will focus on the behavior of adolescents and depict how the natural stage in development alters behavior. Um, thanks to research from Dr. Daniel Siegel and others, we can first define the age range for the adolescent mind is typically between the age of 12 to 24. Uh, however, I do want to note that uh, this is not always the case for everyone. Um, so sometimes uh, development may start earlier than the age of 12 and go on later than the age of 24. Research has shown some girls may start this development uh, change as early as 10, 
or 11. Also dependent on substance abuse, which I will, will, which I will discuss further uh, later, um, it is possible that the mind will not be fully developed um, by or after the age of 24. Um, a key defining point of adolescence or the change in thinking from the child to adolescence um, is the emergence of this hyper-rational thinking. Uh, in fact, Dr. Siegel in his book, he tells us that the brain changes in the early teen years with four main qualities. Of these four main qualities, uh, the mind shifting into novelty seeking, social engagement, increased emotional intensity, and creative exploration. During this time for adolescents, novelty seeking emerges from the increased drive for rewards that creates inner motivation to try something new and feel life more fully. However, the, the downside to this sensation seeking is more risk taking that overemphasizes the thrill and downplays the risk, resulting in dangerous behavior and injury. This hyperrational thinking can turn an impulsive idea into action without pausing to reflect on the consequences. And nevertheless, it also allows adolescents to be open to change and live passionately. Another one of these four qualities is social engagement. For social engagement enhances peer connectedness and creates new friendships. The downside of these routines is that they start to isolate themselves and adults surrounding themselves only with peers and having increased risk behavior. The rejection of adults and adult knowledge and reasoning increases those risks. The upside is that the drive for social connection leads to the creation of supportive relationships that are the research proven best predictors of well being, longevity, and happiness throughout the lifespan. The third quality of the four is increased emotional intensity which gives an enhanced vitality to life. The downside is that intense emotion may rule the day, leading to impulsivity, moodiness, and extreme, sometimes unhelpful, reactivity. The upside is that life with emotional intensity can be filled with energy and a sense of vital drive that gives an exuberance and zest for being alive on the planet. Lastly, creative exploration with an expanded sense of consciousness in adolescence, new conceptual thinking and abstract reasoning allows questioning of the status quo, approaching problems with out of the box strategies, creating new ideas and the emergence of innovation. The downside to this creative exploration is that searching for the meaning of life during the teen years can lead to a crisis of identity, vulnerability, to peer pressure and a lack of direction and purpose. The upside is that if the mind can hold on to thinking and imagining and perceiving the world in new ways within the consciousness, creatively exploring the possible spectrum of experiences, the sense of being in a rut that can sometimes pervade adult life can be minimized. And instead an experience of the ordinary can be uh, become extraordinary. While most measurable aspects of our lives are improving during adolescence, such as physical strength, immune function, resistance to heat and cold, and the speed and agility of how we respond, um, research has shown that we are three times more likely to suffer serious injury or death during this time than when we were in childhood or than we will be in adulthood. This increase is not by chance. Scientists believe it comes from the innate changes in how the brain develops during this period. Sadly, despite teenagers being more physically fit and healthier than children or adults, studies have shown that they actually make up the largest group with avoidable causes of death. By avoidable causes, I speak on the risky or dangerous behaviors leading to permanent injuries or fatalities. With accidents, drug use, wounding from weapons, suicide, and murder, the period from 12 to 24 is the most dangerous time of our lives. 
another shift of the adolescent mind is the disconnect of the pushing away of adults. As children transition into adolescence, they begin to separate themselves from parents and adults. It starts to, and they start to cling to their peers. While pushing away from adults is universal, the increasing number of adolescents who respond to these challenges they face by completely excluding adults from their lives is something unique to modern life. By pushing away from adults and hanging out more with peers during adolescence, adolescents find new ways of dealing with the world and creating new strategies for living. In fact, according to studies, pushing away from adults during adolescence to associate with peers is a vital time for survival. One of the main reasons for peers to connect with one another is the predators will be intimidated by a large group. Very similar to animals instinct, there is safety in numbers. For many, but not all teams, fitting in, fitting in can feel so important. It's an evolutionary holdover of life or death. Yet our world today puts a different kind of stress onto this connectedness and sometimes is severing them with negative consequences of isolation and alienation. So if the pushing away from adults leads the team to become isolated, even from his or her peer, then that total disconnection can be quite disorientating. It is to be noted that adolescents pushing away from others is natural. Shutting others out totally is not helpful, nor is it natural for anyone. Even during the time of adolescence, it's important to keep the lines of connection and communication open and that we need to be members of the connected community. While group collaboration can certainly be a source of collective intelligence, it can also get you to jump off a cliff or uh, drive too fast. In many cultures, the period of adolescence is marked by a culturally sanctioned rite of passage. For boys, there is often a sense of danger and actual risk-taking with the successful completion uh, marked by ceremony. Uh, for girls, adolescence is a time of acknowledgement of fertility, the ability to bear children and care for them so girls are welcomed into the community as new members ready to become a part of the adult generation. Modern culture or rites of passage uh, rites of passages are often missing or minimized in importance. Researchers say that we have lost many of our communal and sanctioned ways of taking risk and acknowledging the transition from childhood to adulthood. Furthermore, with the lack of jobs and great deal of uh, uncertainty about participating in contemporary society, the adolescent period may in many ways be even further prolonged. This is due to modern cultural practices that do not offer transitional relationships with non-parental adults to help acknowledge and facilitate the adolescent period. Another aspect of this transitional period is the process of puberty, which creates changes in the body and changes in our emotions. With puberty, sexual organs development create and change hormone levels. For some individuals, the brain changes of adolescence may occur even before puberty in cases such as delayed sexual maturation. And 100 years ago, the time between the onset of adolescence and the taking, of, the taking on adult responsibilities of working and having raising children was very short. Studies show that in those days, puberty in girls happened around age 15 or 16, and just a few years later, uh, teens would create a new family home. However, 100 years ago, it, that there is now a longer, however, unlike 100 years ago, uh, there is now a longer duration between puberty and the in, in between puberty and the end of adolescence. Adolescence now has no clear endpoint. With that all being said, studies have come out that many adolescents experience 
distress and negative emotional states. We need to remember that these teams are changing a lot and sometimes they'll be one way with one kind of identity feeling a lot and feeling intensely and sometimes they'll be another way feeling nothing and not interacting much. One of the reasons for this is what occurs within the brain. The brain being a collection of cells that communicate with one another using chemicals called neurotransmitters. During adolescence, there is an increase in the activity of neural circuits utilizing dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter um, in creating or drive for reward. Starting in early adolescence and peaking midway through, this enhanced dopamine release causes adolescents to gravitate toward thrilling experiences and exhilarating sensations. Research even suggests that the baseline level of dopamine is lower, but it releases in response to experiences higher, which can explain why teens may report a feeling of being bored unless they are engaging in some stimulating activity. It can also lead them to focus solely on the positive rewards they are sure are in store for them while failing to notice or give value to the potential risks and downsides. The brain's increased drive for reward in adolescents manifests in teens lives in three important ways. One is simply increased impulsiveness where behaviors occur without thoughtful reflection. Impulses inspire action without any pause. Pausing the note pausing enables us to think about other options beyond the immediate dopamine-driven impulse. Something that can affect change or decrease impulsivity is that we call cognitive control. And it is one important source of diminished danger and reduced risk as an adolescent develops. A second in which increased dopamine release affects us during adolescence is the documented increase in our susceptibility to addiction. All behaviors and substance, all uh, drugs and substances that are addictive involve the release of dopamine. As teens, not only are we more likely to experiment with new experiences, we are also more prone to respond with a robust dopamine release that for some can become part of an addictive cycle. A drug or substance can lead to the release of dopamine and we may feel compelled to ingest more of that substance. When the substance wears off, our dopamine plummets, we then are driven to use more of the substance that spiked our dopamine levels. There are at least four fundamental drives that can motivate us, which are experimentation, social connection, self-medication, and addiction. A third type of behavior shaped by the increased reward drives of the added drives of the adolescent mind is something called hyper-rationality. This is how we think in literal concrete terms. We examine just the facts of this, of this situation and don't see the big picture. We miss the setting or context in which those facts occur. With such literal thinking as adolescents, we can place more weight on the calculated benefits of an action than on the potential risk of that action. Studies reveal that teens, we are fully, we are often fully aware of the risks and even that times overestimate the chances of something bad happening. We simply put more weight on the exciting potential benefits of our actions. What happens with hyper-rational thinking is not a lack of thought or reflection as happens with impulsivity and it's not a matter of merely being addicted to a particular behavior or something we are ingesting. Instead, the cognitive process comes from a brain calculation that places a lot of weight on the positive outcome and not much weight on possible negative results. The evaluation of the brain downplays the significance of a negative outcome while at the same time amplifying the significance given to a positive result. This positively biased scale can be activated, especially when teens hang out uh, with other teens or believe their friends will somehow observe their actions. 
as we grow older and mature, our literal thinking of hyper-rationality uh, evolves to what we call uh, just thinking. With just thinking, we consider the larger context of the decision and use intuition to aim for positive values we care about rather than focusing primarily on the immediate dopamine driven reward. Research suggests that risky behaviors in adolescence has less to do with hormonal imbalances than with the change in our brain's dopamine reward system. Combined with the architecture that supports hyper-rational decision-making, creating the positive bias that is dominant during 10 years. Now, uh, can you go to the next slide? Thank you, Danielle. All right, so one of these things that we discuss um, during this time for these teens is that they're undergoing a remodeling period. Um, and if you think about how we would remodel a home or some kind of construction, uh, we know that during that time period, some things aren't going to always be functioning at the highest levels. It's not that they're off. It's not that they don't work necessarily, but they, they are not functioning at their full capability. Uh, so during this time, throughout adolescence, different areas of the brain start to link together, uh, which is a process we call integration. One outcome of integration is the growth of fibers of connected of cognitive control that ultimately decreases impulsivity. As a result, adolescents are afforded more space uh, in the mind to pause and consider other options of response than an initial pulse. Another outcome of this integrative growth is sharpened just thinking whereby the adolescent is able to rely more and more on intuition to see the larger picture of a situation and therefore make wiser decisions. There's nothing wrong with the drive for thrills. However, the issue is how to harness those drives so as to minimize harm to oneself or others. The idea is to respect the dopamine driven need, but channel this drive in helpful ways. If we can instill awareness of the positive sides of these drives and then find constructive approaches to addressing them, tragic outcomes might be avoided. Other examples of reckless teen behavior that went unaddressed, uh, like driving a car without a license and losing the ability to drive later on, taking the chance uh, to have unprotected sex and risking getting disease or getting pregnant, uh, trying combinations of street drugs without knowing their potentially lethal effects. In all these situations, the teen is seeing the pros and de-emphasizing the risk. That's the positive bias of the adolescent mind. Just thinking emerges with both experience and program brain development. In other words, part is timing and the other part can be shaped how much it, it can be shaped how much is dependent on the degree of development that the teen has already gone through. Simply saying, don't do that is not enough. The most effective strategy is to inform. Dr. Siegel uh, also asked these following questions in his book. How do we find a balance between our adolescents' personal decisions and our societal regulations? How can we support our adolescents while also allowing them to find their own voices? And, at, and how at the same time could we set the limits and cautions our own years of living had taught us? A helpful approach that is filled with warmth, limit setting and honoring of autonomy in age appropriate ways is what science would call authoritative parenting, which can be adapted and adopted by any adult when working with an adolescent. Such a stance is also a balanced approach to lending support while supporting separation. It is our duty to provide a safe haven while also encouraging exploration. Attachment is also about both security at home and security in the world. The basic S's of attachment are 
letting kids be seen, be safe, be soothed, and feel secure. It's important to find a network of supportive relationships for parents. In our evolutionary past, we raised children collaboratively and close family or friends or other designated trusted individuals in our tribe cared for our offspring. We realize how unnatural being isolated as parents or as a family truly is. When it comes to village life for the teen, during the time he or she is pushing against parents, there will be other adults in the tribe to whom the teen could turn for security and connection. Yet in the modern era, when the only close adult is your parent, the natural way to go in adolescence is entirely toward other adolescents. As we grow through development, our need for attachment does not end when our childhood emerges into adolescence. It transfers those needs for supportive connections with others to our friends and life partners. Uh, can you go to that last slide for me? Other way. Oh, I'm missing that one. Um, so it's the consideration. Thank you. Sorry, I misread that. So consideration for the future. Um, the things that I've spoken about already as far as the brain science, I hope you gathered that we are needing to understand our children in a different aspect, um, that these are some things that cannot be controlled, um, that every living human being has gone through these natural uh, changes within their mind. And as we go through adolescence, we have to deal with um, these changes and something that I want to uh, press upon us to even think about as we move forward in the presentation and once um, you have time to sit with is that we've only discussed the brain development and brain science behind uh, the general aspect of adolescence. Um, but I want you to think about the mental health aspect, the learning disabilities, the developmental disabilities, the socioeconomic aspects and the environmental influence that um, a lot of our children still deal with to this day. And actually a fun stat um, from the CDC says that one in five adolescents have a learning disability, that being dyslexia, visual processing or audio, auditory processing, auditory processing, et cetera. It also says that one in six from the age of three to 17 have one or more developmental disabilities. Um, this includes autism, cere cerebral, oh, excuse me, cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, and then also uh, the mental health and socioeconomical environmental aspects. So I thank you for your time and I shall now pass it on to Reagan. Thank you, uh, James. Um, I want to pick up really right where you left off um, as we look at the demographics and the bulk of these uh, statistics come either from the um, Indiana Department of Corrections uh, and or the Indiana Youth Institute who has done extensive research um, in gathering these uh, statistics. Uh, James just mentioned uh, that one in five, it is noted that by the CDC that one in five of our children uh, suffer from what may be considered learning disabilities. That is 20%. Keep that number in mind because uh, as of 2017, uh, the national average for juveniles to be uh, incarcerated was 138 for one every for every 100,000, which is 14 uh, 1.14 percent. In Indiana, it is in 2017. It was 185 youth for every 100,000. 
uh, were in the justice system. And here is where you see that one and five or, or two and five that James was just, just talking about. And so while the national average is 14%, you'll see that it is right at 20. Uh, and Indiana alone is seventh in the nation. Uh, next slide, please. The average age uh, for a juvenile to be incarcerated is 18 months, is 18 years. And the average stay is eight months. So we're building um, an argument here. Next slide. As of 2020, 50% of incarcerated children were children of color. In 2020, 91% of the children incarcerated were male. Here's where I draw your attention back to what Danielle said earlier, whereby the courts are not required uh, to report all of these statistics. Um, and because this one stands out, as of the 91% male population that was incarcerated, 49% uh, reported as white, 34% were reported as black, 8% uh, Hispanic, 9% other. And you have two different uh, things at play here. Number one, again, uh, because the courts are not required uh, to report, these numbers may well be skewed. And I think that needs to be brought to our attention as, uh, as a visual, the majority of those that we see in the uh, juvenile justice system are people of color. Another piece uh, that we must consider is that uh, identification is important because we have 9% recording as other, which uh, could perhaps indicate that there are some biracial children there that neither identify uh, neither as black nor white. Next slide, please. As we look at the problem of recidivism, that is uh, those that have been in the system, released and then returned, uh, statistics from 2016 to 2019, there were released uh, a total of 710 uh, individuals, 600 of which were male, uh, 110 were female. Those that returned after uh, only being released for one year uh, was 13.5%. Overall, 14.2% of the males that were released were reincarcerated. 10% of the females that were released were reincarcerated within one year. Over the span of two years, out of the 710, 23.9, or right at 24% of those released were uh, reincarcerated. Of the 600 males that were released, 24% returned. Of the 110 females, 20% were put back into the juvenile justice system. Three years, we have 29%, 29.6% overall. 30.8% of the 600 males and 22.7% of the females that were released, again, returned to the system. What does this data tell us? It tells us that the longer uh, individuals are out after being released initially, the longer they are out, the higher the likelihood is for them to return uh, into the juvenile justice system. Now, many may think uh, that you have a greater chance of staying out the longer you stay out. But keep in mind uh, what James has said about the, the development of the brain. Keep in mind that this is the, the national average is 18 years old. So even at 18, the oldest you are in three years is 21, which means the brain still has not fully functioned and uh, fully developed rather. And while you might be legally considered an adult, you still don't have the, the decision-making prowess of a quote-unquote traditional um, adult or an older adult. Further, and this may be repeated 
uh, later, but we see that if we don't address the needs um, of those that have been released from uh, the juvenile justice system, they have a higher likelihood of returning back into the juvenile justice system. So the quicker we can address needs and meet needs, the, the greater the success rate of not returning. Next slide, please. As we consider looking at uh, the recidivism issue, in 2018, we have 25.1% uh, of the males return into the system, 23.7% of the females return. As we look at that from an ethnic uh, point of view, ethnicity wise, of those that returned, 27% were Hispanic, 26.7%, this is of the data uh, that was submitted, 26.7% were African-American, 26.7% was white, and then 19.5%, again, unidentified uh, with, with their, did not identify their, their gender. And so we have here, um, children or individuals, adolescents, teens and tweens placed into the system. Um, and then they are released from the system, but without any programming, um, without any mentoring that Stacy will uh, discuss, there's a high likelihood that most will, well, that there's a high likelihood that at least 20%, uh, between 20 and 25% will return to the system. Next slide, please. Many that are released from the system are uh, released on probation. And much like adults that are on probation, um, there is electronic monitoring that comes along with that. And so um, what we see here um, is some statistics from Cal we're comparing California and Indiana, because what many don't understand is that uh, the costs that are associated with the juvenile justice system um, is not a matter of just going away uh, for eight months and then coming out free and clear. There are some costs associated even upon your quote unquote uh, freedom. In California alone, to receive an ankle monitor, which will be required uh, by the court, the cost just to set it up ranges between $175 to $200. In Indiana, it is a $50 minimum. There is a daily monitoring fee, which means every day this bracelet is on your ankle, you're paying somebody. In California, that range is between $5 and $40. In Indiana, that range is between $10 and $15, which calculates it to be the monthly monitoring fee in California can range anywhere from $150 to $1,200. In Indiana, from $300 to $450. When you look at that annually, again, it's anywhere in California from $1,800 to $14,400. And in Indiana, from $3,600 to $5,400 every year. And when we consider uh, the economic impact of this, we will soon discover uh, that there are not many families who can afford this type of monitoring uh, or, or economic impact, financial impact that has been placed upon their families. What does this do? It causes many to now be returned back into the system uh, because of a violation um, on the release agreement. In fact, 5.3% return because of a violation, much of which is attributed to the finances. Another piece we can look at regarding the economic impact is this wide range um, of costs that are associated with uh, being released on parole or probation. Uh, uh, in addition to what Danielle talked about uh, earlier. And the discrepancy is simply this, uh, that the 
financial responsibility is not based upon the crime, but rather it is based upon a family's revenue. So there's very little balance. If two people commit the same offense, the, the person that comes from the family that makes the most money will be penalized more than the person that comes from the family that makes a lesser amount, although the crime is the same. What's the point? The point here being is that the system uh, for our children and ultimately our families has been set up in such a way where it continues and perpetuates a cycle of poverty whereby families uh, are penalized more financially for the same crimes. There is, uh, I believe it's the Indiana Department of Corrections that noted that in some cases, the penalty can be uh, daily, get this, either $10 a day, no, no, either uh, an hour's wage or $10 a day, whichever is greater. And so if a, 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 a adolescent or juvenile gets caught in the system and his or her uh, mother or father makes $20 an hour, that will be the fine per day instead of the $10 an hour. Again, another cycle of creating and perpetuating a cycle of poverty. In our discussions, um, and I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, it was shared uh, that there have been cases where uh, one child who was in the system released and had to pay uh, for electronic monitoring. Both the mother and the father had to pay because the, uh, the parents shared joint custody of the child. And so in essence, what happened was that child's penalty was doubled, thereby having that much more of a negative economic impact on the family. And so we see here um, that while statistics, all the statistics are not reported, we do see here the grave danger um, of recidivism. We see uh, the impact economically, and we also see uh, the, the impact of gender and race that uh, all falls into the juvenile justice system. I'll turn it now to Stacy. Reagan, thank you for providing that data. So now I wanna look at the village. You've heard the data, you've heard the history and where we are now. Who is the village? The village is churches, is pastors, city and state leaders, corporations, businesses, nonprofits, schools, teachers, social workers, therapists, community leaders, and individuals. See, the responsibility does not lie in the hands of one. We can't do it by ourselves. It takes all of us to play and be a part of training up a child. So when I look at the next slide, please. When I look at the holistic approach, I look at treating the whole child and not just seeing the youth as a case. A holistic approach means to provide support that looks at the whole person, not just their mental health issues, but the support considers their physical, emotional, social, and spiritual well-being. And each of us has a part to play in making sure that young person is whole again. They come from different experiences and path to recovery is influenced by their age, their gender, their culture, their heritage, language, faith, sexual and gender identity, relationship status, life experiences, and beliefs. We have to look at the whole package. Here's a quote by Jim Casey, he's the founder of UPS. He says, a renewed determination to think creatively, to learn from what has succeeded and what has failed, and perhaps most important, to foster a sense of common commitment among all those concerned with the welfare of children. Renewed determination, common commitment, concern, that's what ties us together. That's where the collaboration begins. Next slide, please. 
So I look at the human toll and Reagan mentioned this, when a person gets sentenced to prison, the whole family serves the time. During the pandemic, many incarcerated young people were denied access to in-person visits from their families. They even spent time in lockdown with no access to sports, vocational training, group therapy, all of that was gone away. It was more than one year later when visits finally returned and they were able to see their family and to receive that support. Impact of fines and fees on family life, increased debt and limited social mobility, all of these play an emotional distress and it impacts the family and it impacts the young people. What happens when a mother is struggling already and now she has to take care of her young person that's incarcerated and she can't afford to because she has smaller children. What happens? That's emotional draining. It's emotional draining. So it does take a human toll. Next slide, please. But there are alternatives to juvenile justice and we have to look at them and we have to explore what's best to serve both the youth involved and society as a whole. There's simply no evidence in favor of locking up so many children. A new study by the Youth Advocate Programs Policy and Advocacy Center documents how thousands of youth served by this program have been served safely at home through community-based programs instead of incarceration. This study finds that more than eight out of 10 youth remain arrest-free and nine out of 10 were at home after completing their community-based program at a cost that is a fraction of what it would have been if they were incarcerated. The report highlights how youth are best served through programs that build on their strength, that engage their family members, that connect them to local community supports. Incarcerated youth are put in isolation, which produces harmful consequences, mental disturbance, and then, we return them back to the community with inadequate resources, no education or support. We're doing our young people a disservice because we're not providing them, strategically providing them programs to help them be successful. Voices. Voices is a, another alternative. It's a 501c3 program in Indianapolis. They, they're utilized as a community alternative to secure detention. System impacted males are referred from the Department of Child Services and Marion County Juvenile Probation. And through this program, youth and families are given the access, they're given resources and support to realize their dreams. The program is an opportunity for youth to heal, to grow and further their paths towards economic self-sufficiency and be civically engaged their lives. Now the leaders of Voices recognize that the work is great and need the support from the village to make a difference on a larger scale. While I applaud and appreciate the work of the Voices, they cannot do it alone. We need your support. When I look at the preschool to prison pipeline, my heart goes out. Dr. Rosemarie Allen, she's an associate professor at the School of Education at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. This is her research. She shows that on an average, 250 preschoolers are suspended each day of the school year. Compared with K through 12 students, preschoolers are suspended at nearly three times the frequency of older students. Preschoolers, preschool to prison pipeline. What we're finding is, is that the national data is pretty much spread equally across all states where young children are being suspended. We do not know their disparities and who's being suspended or not, but we must first have to look at the gender disparities. Boys are suspended a lot. There are usually about 70% of the preschool male population, but their suspension rates far exceeds their presence in the population. Children of color, especially black children. There are only 19% of the preschool population, but there are 48% of those who are suspended. This trend that's very concerning are little black girls who make up of only 20% of the female preschool population. 
but there are 54% of those who are suspended from preschool. There has to be an alternative approach that teaches rather than punishing. Communication, let's meet at the table. What happened to parent conferencing and seeing what we can do to help the young people? Why is, why is this a high rate of suspension for preschoolers? That's a question I want to sit with you. Let's meet at the table. Let's communicate. Let's have a conversation. Next slide, please. Here's a study by Dr. Walter Gilliam that I just had to put in here because it was very interesting to me. In 2016, Dr. Walter Gilliam did a study. He had early childhood professionals at an early childhood conference watch video clips of four children, a white girl, a white boy, a black boy, and a black girl. And what the participants didn't know was that these children were all child actors and there was no misbehaviors. There was no behaviors or challenging behaviors in the video clips at all. But they were asked to watch the video clips to anticipate challenging behaviors. The participants also didn't know that there was an eye tracking device that was being used so that researchers could check what child was being watched. And the black boy was watched much more than any other child. And what's shocking is that 42% of those teachers said he required more of their attention. Just heartbreaking. So if you're always looking to the black boys for misbehaviors, you'll always find it. Is this a preconceived bias that we have about black boys? Next slide. It's time for us to create a model institution of programming to address the needs of our youth in and after juvenile justice. Unconscious bias training for teachers and professionals who are working with our young people. A mentoring program for the girls and for the boys. Parenting classes for youth who are parents as well as for adult parents. Employment readiness training, how to complete an application, how to do a job interview. Anger management classes, conflict resolution classes, tutoring, reading and math should be priority. Mental illness rehab is rehabilitation, it should be offered. GED classes for those who haven't completed their high school education and financial literacy. We need to create a model. And here are some programs that you can start with in your area. What is our responsibility? What can we do now? I'm glad you asked. It is time for us to get involved by advocating for change in youth juvenile justice across the country not just Marion County, but across the country. Financially partner with youth justice centers to sponsor programming for the youth. Get involved, ask questions, support early intervention programs to help stop the cradle to prison pipeline and initiatives created to support the minds, the body, the spirit of youth. Offer programming services to youth at your respective businesses. Take time, spend time with young people. Find out what they need. Be that, be that, be that for them, whatever it is. Offer job opportunities and internships to a youth, giving the youth exposure and experience. Speak up. It's time. Get involved. It's time. Mentor a youth. It's time. Tutor a youth. It's time. And definitely financially support youth programs. It does take a village. You are the village. Wow, this was such a riveting, riveting uh, presentation. And you see now on the screen that there are additional resources that are a part of this 
uh, presentation. Let me extend my sincere appreciation to each of our presenters today, to Danielle Briggs, James Rogers, Reagan Robinson, and Stacy Webb. Each of them are MDiv students here at Christian Theological Seminary, and they are bringing the very best of theological integration to practical solutions to helping us think about what it means to help all of our children live fully as children of God created in the image of God and in particular to our conversation today focusing on the injustice of the juvenile justice system and what we can do as the village as the community that takes a both and approach the both and of confronting the injustice justice of the system and working to make the kind of systemic changes that are needed so that all children um, can live and thrive and far fewer cis children are being uh, ensnared in this juvenile justice system, while at the same time getting involved with youth, working directly with families that need additional support for businesses and, and organizations to be able to provide jobs and opportunities. There is something that we all need to do with the both end approach. We need to speak up, stand up, speak out to change this system of injustice, and at the same time working directly with young people providing opportunities and helping to create a future filled with hope. I hope that you feel inspired to get involved in the communities right where you are. Our children need us. They're looking to us. They're waiting for us. And we trust that by faith, as we join our hands, we join our hearts, that God will continue to work through us in ways that we never imagined if we would but just come together and put our minds and ourselves to work. And so we thank you all for joining us today. Please share this recording with your church groups, with your businesses, with your organizations, with young people. Uh, we want them to know the facts. We want them to know what's happening. We want them to understand what's going on. So feel free to share this information broadly and widely. And we do pray that it will be yet a part of helping to make a difference to create a future filled with hope for our children. Thank you. God bless you. Take good care. Bye-bye.